How long did you think you could get away with it? Oh, you, you really thought we wouldn't notice? You really thought that we didn't see? Oh no, we knew. We saw. We've known for a while, actually. You thought you could get away with it, didn't you? You thought you could get away with not being subscribed to Carl Jobs or more patterns, but you couldn't. We caught on to you. And you know what? It didn't take a decade. It didn't take 12 years. You know, there's still crimes being prosecuted years and decades after they happen. Still people being found out for how they've done immoral deeds. The Zodiac Killer was just recently found, but now we're going to see someone that's done something even worse cheated in a Mario speedrun, and they've been found after 12 years. Hello, you absolute legends. When it comes to cheating in speedruns, there are several popular methods that people normally employ. One is to directly modify the game they are playing in order to give themselves better luck. The most famous examples of this come out of Minecraft, where players use mods to change the RNG. And that's what happened to Dream, I believe. I mean, <laughs> a lot of things have happened since then, but that was... A big speedrun drama, wasn't We've it? We've also been seeing this recently in Monster Hunter, where players have been changing the behavior of bosses in order to get faster kills. What is it with Monster Hunter and people cheating speedruns? Like, just recently we had the last that was blindfolded, but not actually blindfolded. Now people are what is it about monster speedruns that really makes people want to cheat? Monster speedruns? Monster Hunter speedruns. Also, haven't played one of those games. Are they good? Players can also modify the game to run in a different way to make things easier. This was a huge problem in Trackmania, where players were using Cheat Engine to play the game at half speed, making it easier to perform precise inputs. The Oh, and then you would just double the speed of the footage afterwards? Ooh, could you really get away with that? play the record back at normal speed, and no one could tell the difference. Oh, Another okay. Another method of cheating is to use external tools to play the game. Oh, because you can save a replay of your own attempt in that game, and you'd replay it. Okay, that does make sense. ...for you, and then pretend you're playing. This has been a huge problem in Geometry Dash, and there is always an arms race going on between cheaters and moderators. Mo and there's always people that cheat splits. They'll do like a very good split on one part of the run and then they'll keep that recording and they'll try and splice it in a way that makes it look legitimate. At least that used to be an issue with a lot of older speedruns. I think that used to be an issue with like Halo speedruns. are always looking for ways to detect external tools and cheaters are always looking for ways to make their fakes more believable. But one of the most ancient and by far the most popular techniques speedrunners use is the splice. Obviously, the longer that's a speedrun is, the more difficult it is to play through without making any mistakes. The splice, that's it, yes. When you take your best sections of each individual part of each individual game and then put them all together, well, it's not in, a, in it's not one run. You're not doing amazing on this one run. You're just getting all the best segments and putting them together. That's, that's not cool. Don't. Don't. So to make things easier, cheaters will play through small sections until they do them well, and then stitch them together with video editing, so that it looks like it's one continuous run. With the rise of live streaming, splicing has become less of a problem in recent times, because- Because most people will just live stream their runs, and if you record it, there's always a, oh, okay, like, you recorded it, how are we going to verify that you actually did this correctly? Usually on live streams, it's a lot easier, because while you could record a video, and then put it on your stream. It's a lot harder when you have things like face cams, you have like input cams as well, the keyboard cameras, or something on screen that shows the inputs. It's very hard to keep those lined it's up. It's just harder to fake something like this live. The players you- Is he playing the Japanese version of Goldeneye? He is. Kikado. Oh my god, I can read the first little part of that message. Key card or I think he just picked up a key card. <laughs> you really need to worry about are those that achieve records offline. And back before Twitch became popular, this was basically everyone. And when it comes to splicing, the, ground. the game where it's been abused the most is almost certainly Super Mario 64. Which is the most competitive speedrun game of all time, I think? It has to be, surely. There can't be many speedrun games that are more competitive than this, or have, have remained so consistently played through decades of speedrunning, since the beginning, the inception of video game go fast modes. Historically, the most common way to detect splicing is by looking for anomalies in the audio track. However, oh, that's a good. I didn't even think about that. Because if you have like hard cuts, it's easy to splice video together because you know on black screens and things like that, it'll be very easy. Audio though. That's However, a good quite one. Quite a few of the ancient world records have terrible audio quality and makes this impossible. Without any really stupid continuity errors in the splicing process, it seems like it would be impossible to confirm if a splice had been done. But recently this has all changed, with a brand new, almost foolproof detection method being implemented and it immediately exposed a fake world record from all the way back in 2011. 
Also, I would like to say, uh, Carl makes absolutely wonderful videos, and you should definitely, you know, give a look at their Patreon, which I'll link in the description of this video as well, if you want to take a look at it, you know, support them, because these videos are absolutely fantastic, and we want to see more people not only watching them, but supporting them any way they can as well. This new method is great for two reasons. One, obviously you can expose faked runs, but also two, on the flip side, you can also confirm that world records aren't spliced, which is equally as important. And in today's video, we will take a quick look at what this new method was. I really hope you enjoy. Here we go. All right, dude, that was a, that was a two and a half minute intro. It didn't even feel like an intro. Now, Legends, I'm excited because today we have a very special sponsor. Michael oh, yep. oh is let's go! an amazing go. best-selling fantasy author who just it's released his third book in his series, Songs of Chaos. If you read Eragon when you were younger, you will absolutely love Songs of Chaos. Wait, the story follows Holt Cook, a lowly servant boy who was never supposed to be destined for greatness. A book sponsor? That's really cool. But in a twist of fate, he rescues the egg of a blind dragon that was supposed oh. to be put to death because dragons don't tolerate weakness. The pair form a bond, and together, the two outcasts must scramble to survive in a harsh world, fight off a horrifying undead threat, and uncover secrets that will change the world forever. Personally, I've really Pretty been sick. enjoying the first book, Ascendant. The narration is incredible, voiced by the legendary Peter Kenny, who also narrated the Witcher series. As I need to listen to audiobooks. I swear, I've never listened to an audiobook before, but I really should get Send on that. It is almost 18 hours long and only costs one audible credit, which is amazing value. All three That's books so valuable. almost 70 hours. Please click the link in the description and grab a copy of the first book, Ascendant. Or and you can try for zero. Like reading is also available on Kindle or paperback. I can't recommend it enough. Pretty cool. That's now, so cool. before we begin, a big shout out to Drogi, who recently made a video discussing this new method, which is where I learned about it myself. So definitely go and check out his video if you want some more in-depth information, and be sure to subscribe to his channel. So this record must have been like a very big one in order to actually have people looking into it 13 years later, Back surely. around 2010, 2011, Super Mario 64 was dominated completely by Japanese runners, and one of them was known as Tsukishima. Even if you don't know anything about the history of the game, if you followed Super Mario 64 speedrunning before, you might have heard this name anyway. And that's because in the very first Bowser stage, there is something called the Tsukishima Cycle. Near the end of the stage are these rotating platforms, and you need them to be in a certain position in order to get the red coin. If you get there too late, you'll need to wait for the next cycle of rotation. If you go through the stage really fast, you can start to catch earlier and earlier cycles. And the fastest cycle that players currently use is called the Tsukishima cycle. Damn, look at the movement on this. It actually blows my mind how people can move through the game so well. I don't consider myself like the greatest gamer in the world, but seeing people do this, they just flow. It's like they're a river and they're going downhill. It's like they, they're in shoot. They are Mario. They are Mario himself. this because Tsukishima caught this cycle all the way back in 2011, and it was insane for the time. Ooh, also in that. 2011, Tsukishima achieved the world record in the 16-star category, getting a time of 16 minutes and 11 seconds on the 10th of April. Unfortunately, 16 star category, 16 minutes and 11 seconds. And that was so, so, so long ago. Let's see where the record sits at right now. So we have 120 stars, 70 stars, 16 star. And the record sits at 14 minutes and 35 seconds, which was set one year ago. And for the number one spot, we got ourselves one hour, 36 seconds for 120 stars and super freaking Mario. That's insane. Simply, actually, a streamer is still going, still grinding out PBs. Look at that, 14 days ago, the number seven record was set. And it's only about a minute and 10 seconds behind the world record too, which is, I don't know. This is still such a competitive race. It's so cool. I wonder how long it'll take to reach the point of no return where it's just like, okay, it's physically impossible to get any faster than this. Fortunately for him, it would only remain the record for a single day when another oh. Japanese legend, Shigeru, took the record back with a 1606. Tsukishima's 16-star record, as short-lived as it was, was still noteworthy, though. For instance, it successfully implemented the pole warp in the second Bowser stage. Players did go for this previously, but at the time, no other players were able to do it successfully in a world record speedrun. Is this going to be a case of someone that was genuinely really good at the game that just wanted that little bit more of clout because they were pushed off the top spot, so they turned to cheating? Even though they were genuinely really good and they had some real skill, but they just couldn't 
stay away. They needed to get a little bit more of that fame. This trick wouldn't be implemented in a world record again after this for another four years, when the runner Zaya did it to achieve a 1535 in 2015. The other noteworthy thing about Shikishima's run was that he had only been speedrunning the game for one year, which is a tiny amount compared to other top players. Aside from this, however, there was nothing obviously suspicious about the world record, but the context in which it was set is still important. Given that quite a few Japanese speedrunners during this era were ultimately exposed for cheating in one way or another, it why wait really so many japanese speedrunners specifically were exposed for cheating what's going on over there what's happening japan why, why are you cheating so much what are you doing come on guys makes sense to question every record from this time if Tsukishima did splice this speedrun the most obvious way to check would be to examine the audio track for any irregularities oh yeah you can see right here there's like a hard cut on the audio here that might imply like uh a change or like a cut from one scene to another uh, I don't know. I guess you could have a fade. Could make sense if there's a fade in the game audio, but a hard cut that you see on the right here, that kind of seems a little suspicious to me. The place players have always chosen to splice runs has been just after they enter or exit a level. There is a brief period where the screen is black and where there is no audio. Oh yeah, there we go. And there is no audio. Yeah, that's going to make it really hard to verify. Playing. This is by far the easiest place to hide a splice. But yeah. even though there is no game audio, there is still something being recorded. Capture devices will pick up a slight electrical hum called mains hum. So the audio track should never be truly silent. If a splice is could you not splice the mains hum together surely if you start recording at that point as well it would still have the same audio oh but it would be slightly different wouldn't it it would be a little bit different because the hum is I mean, it might be consistent but if you change out one with another, the cut between the two parts is still going to be visible, I would assume. If done poorly, there will be complete gaps in this background noise, as was the case with a 2005 world record by the player Marius M. If the splice is done well, you need to look a bit closer. Given that the mains hum is normally a consistent 60 hertz, you can check to see if each tick is the same distance apart. And if not, that's an indication it has been spliced. Ooh, that's a good one. Very, Several very smart, that. records were famously caught by detecting an inconsistent hum in 2014. Unfortunately, the audio quality on Tsukishima's world record is so poor that this method cannot be reliably used. <laughs> what if that is by design? What if he was so smart that he knew in the future there would be a way to check it's like ah well if i make the audio so disgusting and unlistenable i mean who needs the audio anyway you just need the visuals it no one's gonna ask any questions right <laughs> <laughs> the hum is still there, it's just a bit too quiet and gets lost in the background static. The run also doesn't have any continuity errors, like for instance the coin high score not matching up. Historically, mm. these were the only methods to try and detect splicing, but thankfully in 2023, a brand new method was created. What would you even do? In 2016, SM64 scientist Pan and Coke released a video outlining the mechanics around character blinking. No way. They're going to track Mario's blinks on the frames that he blinks on? The video on? covers blinking mechanics for a host of NPCs, but the oh most relevant God. information pertains to Mario. As Mario performs actions, he still blinks on a regular cycle since the animation timer is not affected by his actions. So Mario will always blink on a very consistent timer. Mario will blink every 64 frames, which is okay. just over every two seconds. This is extremely consistent. It's not affected at all by Mario's movement, and more importantly, the blinking timer remains constant even when entering and exiting levels. This means that if you see Mario blink before he enters a level, you should be able to count frames and predict exactly when he should blink again once inside. Of course, oh, Mario's eyes aren't all... man. How do you figure this stuff out, man? Who's the guy that's sits down and is like, ah, yes, Mario's eyes. We need to look deeper into his eyes. Mario, are you blinking? It's visible, but that doesn't matter. If you miss one blinking cycle or even several, you can just continue to count. And as long as the next visible blink is still on that 64 frame cycle, it's okay. It seems pretty obvious now, but it actually took seven years for someone to finally realize that keeping track of Mario's blinking would be a good way to detect possible splices. And well, yeah, I mean, yeah, that does seem like a pretty difficult thing to figure out. Am I just an idiot? That definitely seems difficult. It would be the 120 star world record holder Ouija who would come to this realization in mid-2023. The Oh, so he's the number one in the world and he figured this out? Smart guy.
Smart fella. The easiest time to see when Mario blinks is when he grabs a star and after he exits a level, as his eyes are clearly visible for a long time. And given that all of the stars in a 16 star run are relatively short, it's very easy to calculate when Mario should blink. In practice, of course, there is some nuance to it. For example, you do need to remove some frames when the blink timer pauses briefly between level transitions, but it's still all very consistent and predictable. From here, SM64 historian Frosty Zarko would begin trawling through some of the ancient Japanese records, testing this theory. Upon examining the record from Shigeru, achieved a day after Tsukishima's record, he found that Mario's blinking behaved exactly as the theory predicted. In fact, there was not a single instance found in the entire run where the blinking didn't behave as expected. How Damn, keeping track of Mario's blinks like that is insane. Although he is just doing it based on the stars, so he's not doing it based on every single blink throughout the entire run, which would be like many, many hundreds, and it would take so, so long. He's just doing it based on the stars. So as long as it's consistent, when you see the star, you can tell that things look legitimate. However, when looking at Tsukushima's run, the blinking was all over the place. On at oh, least no. nine different stars, Mario blinked at completely unexpected times. Did he splice it on every star? Indicating that there had to have been a splice. There is simply no other explanation. There's no way he's split. Okay, come on, man. Let's not be so egregious with Several it. Several weeks after Tsukushima's record was determined to be spliced, footage of an even older run he did from 2010 resurfaced. This was a 16 star run of 1620 that was performed on emulator. Again, the blinks were inconsistent, confirming splices. But. Oh, I wonder if he knows. I wonder if he knows he's been caught. I mean, it's been 12 years. I, he might not even be a speedrunner anymore, but. Had to be found out after so long as well. Oh, this time the run even had continuity issues. In the I wonder how old he was when he did this stage. Womp's fortress. When he collected the first star, he obtained five coins. So when he re-entered the stage, it showed he had a coin high score of five. This makes sense. But after collecting the second star of the stage and entering again, it now showed a coin. Oh, high that's score. egregious. Okay, that is a really big one. That is a smoking gun. That is the big flag that you're waving. Score of 12. This doesn't make sense because on the second star, he didn't obtain any coins at all. So his coin high score should still have been 5. Errors like this can happen if you splice runs and don't check all of the details. It's apparent that Tsukishima had been... That one actually could have been caught when it was uploaded. That could have been caught in 2010. I mean, that's that's pretty straightforward. Cheating for over a year and had begun cheating almost immediately after joining the community. This also puts a massive doubt on the world record he achieved in the first Bowser stage, where he was honored by having the fastest cycle named after him. Check the blinks. Check the blinks. Check Mario's eyes. We need to see his eyes. I'm curious to see if people now start calling it something else. And just as I was making this video, it was confirmed that even Tsukishima's single level world records from back in 2011 were faked as well. The oh, most no. obvious example is on his run of the third Bowser stage. After doing this long jump and taking fall damage, you can see Mario's health bar warp instantly to the top of the screen. This isn't what's supposed to happen. Looking at a legitimate run, you can see the health bar remains lower for a little while longer and then smoothly moves to the top of the screen. This even Why does happens it... when you pause the game. So what? What happened How could that happen? Tsukishima paused the game after making the jump and taking damage. While the game was paused, the health bar moved to the top of the screen, so that when he unpaused... Oh my god, ooh, you can kind of see there as well. If we go frame by frame, if we go, if we look deeper, the numbers, Mason, what do they mean? So he pauses, oh, look at that, yeah, he pauses on that frame, look at that, and he doesn't even move. It just jumps to the top of the screen, you can even see, you can see the frame in which it happens too. Damn, that is... That's bad, man. Come on, dude. What are you doing? And when he unpaused, the health bar was already at the top. The reason he paused is so that he could create a save state to keep retrying from this point. Then oh, that's later, fucked up. he used video editing to remove the pause. I can't but it's so blatantly obvious too, because you can see it happen in the frame. You can create see it. the same effect using this clip. When the game is paused, you can see the health bar move. But if I remove the pause, it will instantly warp. So it really seems like everything that Tsukishima did was a total lie. Tsukishima That's really unfortunate. isn't the only player that- Because you still have to be at least relatively good at the game to e get these good splits as well. It's not like it's an easy game to play. I mean, I, I do love just diving into the depths of these cheers and speedruns. Why do they do it? I wish we could see. I wish we could get an explanation. What are you doing? You just want a little bit of clout? Because it's not the biggest thing in the world. It's not like it killed someone or did some horrible, horrible thing. They just, they cheated in a speedrun. And that's very, very immoral. And that's very bad. 
Why would you would you do it for? Why'd you do it? What's that's going been on? Caught with this new method, a couple of recent runs from even within the last year were caught as well. And when exposed, the person admitted they were spliced. These oh, runs, however, man. weren't from the very top players, and they were also achieved offline. As I mentioned okay. at the beginning of the video, players that live stream their attempts are far less likely to cheat, and essentially, all of the top SM64 runners play live. The I don't understand. If you would live stream an attempt, what the purpose of cheating would even be? Because you're definitely going to get caught. The chances of you being able to get away with it are so high. And seeing videos like this, you know people are going to be on your ass for over 10 years, potentially. You're going to have to wake up to a sweat and see the night terror in the corner of your room. Except it's not a monster. It's someone posting in a Discord server. The simple fact is that the overwhelming majority of cheated speedruns are from people who play in secret and then upload their runs to YouTube. This is yeah. why so many ancient runs end up getting exposed. Back in the day, hardly anyone streamed and cheating really was a lot more common. Which it is good though that cheating is becoming less common, but I love hearing these stories though at the same time. I'm kind of sad that there's going to be less and less of them, but it's nice that they're being caught. I want to know what his reaction is though. Ooh, what does he think? Is he is he sad? Is he guilty? Does he not care because it's been 12 years and he's moved on and he has a wife and kids and uh, three dogs now, three little Shiba Inus that he plays with every day? That's, what's, what's going on with them? Which just goes to show how important streaming is and how important good proof standards are. Again, a big thanks to Drogi for his video on the subject. Go and subscribe to his channel. And a big thanks to Frosty Zarko for doing an amazing job documenting the history of Super Mario 64. Thank you so much for watching, you legends. I hope... I will also leave the description, I'll leave them in the description as well as Carl and Carl's Patreon if you would love to take a look at that. I'm sure he'd really appreciate that. And if you want to, you can always subscribe here as well.